Robin W. Thornburn is a hypnotherapist with exclusive hypnotherapy, the longest established hypnotherapy practice in Edinburgh, Scotland, where his reputation precedes him with his proven record of helping people achieve lasting change through professional confidential clinician hypnotherapy in psychotherapy. Robin Thornburn is an experienced psychotherapist and motivator with 28 plus years of experience. He has successfully conducted over 12,000 therapy sessions. He owns the largest full-time hypnopsychotherapy practice in Edinburgh. He's trained with the National College of Hypnosis and Psychotherapy, one of only a few organizations of its kind in Britain that is externally accredited by the British Accreditation Council. Now, Robert is also a full member of the National Register of Hypnotherapists and Psychotherapists, qualifying with a practical distinction and writing a dissertation on cognitive methodologies. Robin is also a member of the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy and a UKCP accredited supervisor. His training is equivalent to that of a master's degree and he has advanced diplomas in hypnopsychotherapy and has written extensively on the subject of hypnotherapy and rational emotive behavior therapy cognitive behavioral therapy Robin also has presented his unique approach of rational emotive behavior therapy and hypnotherapy in the teachings of Dr. Claire Weeks at the National College of Hypnosis and Psychotherapy College Conference in England, and it is approved provider to the British Psychological Society course, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, its theory and practice with hypnotherapy, also a British Psychological Society accredited hypnotherapy training course, the application and practice of hypnotherapy. Robin presented with Dr. Jaffe Ellis, wife of the originator of cognitive therapy and trustee of Dr. Albert Ellis's legacy at the British Psychological Society's conference in Brighton. Robin has written two books, the first on anxiety and depression, which includes a foreword from Dr. Albert Ellis, and the second on how he made a remarkable recovery using hypnotherapy and REBT after he suffered a debilitating stroke. In this upcoming interview, you will hear Robert Thorburn and I discussing how he merges the practices and the benefits of hypnotherapy with the REBT method in cognitive emotive behavior therapy for maximum results. And he even does a real life hypnotherapy session on yours truly in real time. I'd like to invite you now to listen to my interview as we journey into the depths of hypnotherapy with Robert Thornburn. So looking at your methods and the way that you incorporate hypnotherapy with cognitive attributes like the REBT method for that full encompassed concept of taking the benefits of understanding the brain wiring and that cognitively in a very aware intentional space, we can redirect the rudder and redirect the focus and the channeling. But then there's those layers of the shadows, the Carl Jung concepts of the subconscious, that these programs are so deeply ingrained, we see the behavior patterns, and they click on like the troubleshoot, those feelings factors, triggers and and making it a little bit more difficult to navigate through. And so you merge the two, which was just mind blowing to me. And I know the effectiveness of that. So I was really excited to hear more about the element of yeah, I can see change. um... I hear people say that quite a few times to me that their problems may be deep rooted. And I'm a great believer in choice. If the person has sufficient choice, if they want to change something about themselves, it usually takes a while, but they can change things pretty quickly. Usually by the time I get to see a person, they've been through quite a lot of emotional pain in their life. And a lot of them have done a lot of thinking themselves anyway. So I'm really, if you like, here is a sort of a catalyst or a kickstart to try and get them moving in the right direction. Um, If someone's a bit too despairing about the state they're in and they feel they'll never change things, I I say to them that for 50 weeks of the year, I drive in the left in Britain. And for two weeks of the year, COVID permitting, I drive in the right in France. So if you want to change something badly enough, like stay alive whilst driving a car in France, you can do it if you want. It's all about choice. I think Milton Erickson, the great hypnotherapist, would often say that if there was a plank of wood a foot wide stretching from one wall to the other, and if he was to to offer the client $1,000 to walk across it, the client would usually say, no problem. 
And Ericsson would then say, yes, but what if there was a pit of snakes underneath the plank of wood? Oh, that is different, they say. So in my view, all that really changes is a person's focus of attention moves to what's relevant to what is not. And I think one of the biggest problems, that certainly Dr. Albert Ellis and, of course, Debbie has pointed out, that when a person feels bad, they usually think even worse as a result. And then they convince themselves of even more negativity, they become even more despairing, more depressed, and they feel even more stuck. So I think I certainly start my sessions with a person to cognitively point out where, the, where they're probably going wrong with their thinking. And as, as Albert Ellis would point out, a lot of demands and inaccurate definitions tend to cause a lot of problems. A good example would be a student may come in here and say, I've got an exam coming up. I feel really anxious. And I'll ask them, what is it you're telling yourself about the exam? And invariably they'll say, I must get an A. And if not, I'm a total failure. So they'll sneak in a global self rating. So naturally with such great stakes, i.e. their whole self, they'll then become anxious, not concerned, which is manageable and almost normal, I suppose, under the circumstances. A really good rule of thumb that a lot of my clients really like, because I try to furnish them with a toolbox that they can manage their own thoughts with. Sadness, annoyance, concern is okay. Depression, anger, anxiety tends to debilitate. And I say, if you were preferring to have 10 pounds in your pocket and you only had nine, how would you feel? Concerned. I'll say, okay, supposing you were saying that you should, you ought, you must have 10 pounds in your pockets and you only had nine, how would you feel? They say anxious. So the, the, the emotion moves from manageable concern to debilitating anxiety, but more specifically in the thought process, it moves from a, a flexible preference into a dire need. And that then scares the nervous system, which is pr probably already sensitized to, with fear and bewilderment anyway. So the nervous system goes slightly out of balance, produces even more symptoms, and the person then demands that they mustn't have the symptoms. It's a bit like every time the doorbell rings and the dog barks, I shout at the dog, the dog barks louder the next time the doorbell rings. It's a vicious circle. So people find this quite interesting because it reduces a lot of the bewilderment and they, they tend to replace the bewilderment and fear with acceptance based on knowledge and understanding. That's really crucial, I found, in helping a person long term to maintain recovery. And then I co join it with hypnotherapy. It, now, it's so incredible because a lot of people, you know, from like the neuroscience concept standpoint of what, of what you're saying is that a lot of people just think I'm having a feeling, I'm having emotion, and we tend to be in the mask the symptom kind of world, right? Where it's yeah. like, let me take something, make the symptom go away. But meanwhile, that tumor or the shadows or these concepts and these triggers are just festering if you just, you know, kind of take away that triggered spot. And what people may not know is that in that moment, you know, the brain is the most powerful, you know, computing system, you know, in our in our heads, but in a primitive state, it's intended to do an amazing thing. And that's keep us alive. And yeah, so in doing that, point. yeah, and so in doing that, it's like it puts everything into two categories, like in nanoseconds. And then when this anxiety is, you know, kind of triggered in the body, those hormones are produced because the body says anxiety is a natural state of you know, there's somebody coming at me, I need to remove myself for my safety. The body, you know, exudes this anxiety chemical response to move, fight or flight. It's healthy and natural when it's serving us. But like you said, this, this belief system and this pattern of focus, you know, these underlying belief systems, when they're staying in that state or in that primal state, that primitive state of anxiety, the hormones are created actively, cortisol levels. I mean, it's literally symptomatic for, you know, psychosomatic symptoms and these anxiety attacks, things like that. And so again, again, I have to kind of throw this out there. This is not a message to stop taking any kind of psychiatric drugs, but it's a concept of learning that there's some empowering tools 
that you can incorporate to actively change the chemical structure of your body by taking yeah. some very real steps that you walk Absolutely. people through. I found over the years that for many people that are suffering from anxiety, that they are inadvertently moving control from themselves by worrying too much about what other people think about them. I liken it a bit like that if your self-worth was a crystal vase and you kept handing it over to someone, you'd become pretty anxious thinking, what if they drop it? They create an ego defense mechanisms. There's three core beliefs in rational emotive behavior therapy. The first one is, is very relevant. Um, I must be liked. I must come across well. I must not look foolish. And if I do, it's all my fault. That usually leads to anxiety, shame, guilt, etc. So with this demand, which creates the emotion, the emotion then interacts on the thinking, and it's very much a vicious circle. And I think being more philosophical and seeing what's happening allows a person to step back. The great Australian doctor, Claire Weeks, she was the first woman um, to qualify at Sydney University with a doctorate in science. And then at age 37 became a GP. She, she said after 40 years in medical practice dealing with all sorts of nervously related problems, she said the one thing that kept a sufferer still stuck even years after the original event were recurring bouts of memory through sight, sound, smell, taste. And she emphasized memory brought back the feeling that they disliked. Now, Albert Ellis would argue that that feeling is coming from a demand and an inaccurate definition so that when the memory then slavishly brings it back, the person adds another demand and inaccurate definition, such I must not have this and it's awful that I do. And so, again, it's very much reinforcing um, the, 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 the original problem. And I, I teach a client many, in many respects that a problem is a bit like a wave. And if you stand up against it, it'll knock you over. But if you go under the wave, you'll come out the other side. I think Milton Erickson once said that you can always yield and come out and top. He said, I take control of any rebellion by telling them how to rebel. I love the, the kind of like that neutralization concept because if people feel that they do have or are in control or empowered, then they tend to stop fighting because that's basically yeah. the innate structure for why people push back. You know, you know, yeah. this is a sign of the times and I actually had a very positive correspondence with the World Health Organization individual when he like they talked about all of these things and you're seeing people say no. Some people say yes, some people say no. And I believe everyone has the opportunity and the right to choose the treatment that they want. But the minute you tell somebody that they have no choice or you take away the concept of their of free will, you're going to stir the very revolt that then all of a sudden you create your own problems that you have to calm down. We could, oh, we could go hours on that one. That might be a fun follow up. But if you don't mind, what I'd like to do for those that possibly you and I are very familiar with Dr. Um, um, Albert Ellis and, and Dr. Um, Debbie Jaffe Ellis. And so we also are familiar with this concept of this awfulization. So I want to just give them those three background when we talk about how the demands, you know, like if you don't treat me the way I want you to treat me, then you've lost value. If I if the world doesn't give me or I don't get what I want, then I'm not OK with that. And if I don't achieve or behave in a certain way, then I'm not good enough. And tracing it back again to some of these wiring of the human beings, and we can go to our roots, and it teaches us so much about us, is that the everybody wants to be seen, heard, and know that they are safe. And then some people look at the, the um, human needs, the six human needs, and items like this. Basically, if we go back, we are human beings that were wired to be in a tribe. You know, there was a time period that if we were not in our tribe, we were in danger. Therefore, loss of tribe, loss of love and connection in these things can deem a sense of anxiety. Like you said, a sense of self-worth, you know, putting that in somebody else's hands. And, you know, when we know the wiring and the firing of these things that we could go into, it allows us to be that observer and ask more questions and stop making the world around us 
our weighted blankets and our binkies, as I like to say, you know, you need to, I need you to calm me down. I need to, I need you to behave a certain way and really take that empowerment. And what I love in Dr. Um, Albert Ellis is that he basically, for those that don't know, when he debunked Freudianism, and you posted something on this, I think I loved. And, and, and like when he talked about, like he really moved into the Carl Jung concepts of we hold, we are empowered creatures. And instead of blaming, you know, our parents or, or, or this concept of it's somebody else's issue, you know, he had to in his personal life take a stance of self empowerment. And people are always, we are always better off when we understand we are empowered. And it also makes us own up a little bit, right? We have to be like, yeah, I can't blame you for this. I've got to own, I've got to own my power, which also means I need to own myself, my behavior, my feelings, my emotions. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what you're saying is we always have a choice of how we react to situations and external events. In, in cognitive therapy, there's a, 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 a thing called an EBC form, and people usually go from the activating event to the consequence rather than telling, looking at what they're telling themselves about the situation. But one of the problems, Francis, is that over the years, the person has maybe had a problem for a long time and they felt it very intense, you know, with great intensity. Um, so that the memory, as I said earlier, brings back an intense feeling. The nervous system by this stage has become sensitized or aroused, it's trigger happy. So that it's firing off impulses too acutely. And this is very much, you know, affecting the person's thinking in the moment. So they're very much become fearful of the state that they're now in. I mean, in many respects, I teach people that by the time I get to see them, their body's reacting very normally in the situation that they've been under for, you know, for, for months, if not years. It's how they now react to it. Um, for example, many people complain bitterly about a churning stomach. And I teach them that a lot of the time it's the stomach breaking up stored food substances to send extra energy to peripheries to wield off a perceived attack, fight or flight response. So that helps them um, when they understand what's happening. And I think where the value of hypnotherapy is is that it tends to calm a lot of those secondary disturbances or symptoms that the person has so that they can then think more clearly. Because the nervous systems become sensitized, the person's too keyed up. So when hypnotherapy calmly relaxes the nervous system, the person can think more clearly as well. It's a very good um, tranquilizer, I would say, is hypnotherapy. It's, be it's so beautiful. And it's like you can it can it can be as though it's like if someone goes to the ER, a lot of times people understand, you know, when we talk about the subconscious of these thoughts, these are kind of like abstract or invisible to us. You know, it's like we see very physical, physical, you know, physical responses yeah. based on these things, but they're still so it's like we'll, we'll use the analogy of someone going into the ER, you know, you go in there if you are bleeding and you have a serious, you know, you know, wound. It's noticeable. And what does a doctor do? It says, what is causing the most pain? Where are you bleeding out? What is the issue right there? They immediately go to that first. And so now if you would take us into, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. I love into the journey, you know, of oneself here and via the thinking where we understand now that we've understand this concept, you know, and, and I often like to, to compare the brain and the understanding or the thinking body to be like that gate. If we understand a concept exists, from there, we can travel deeper into the recesses of ourselves via that concept and the understanding of that concept. So now that we've identified some very physical things that people you know, see, would you take us now into that more abstract and you know, what does hypnotherapy look like? You know, again, I want to put a, you merge both elements, which is why I believe that your approach is so powerful and has been so powerful and impactful for so many people. But now some people have like a Hollywood's version of hypnotherapy, you know, where you see the watch clock just kind of going, <laughs> yeah. getting very sleepy, you know? And so now if you could just walk us through yeah. and define it for us, what is that? What does hypnotherapy look but, like? What is it? Mate, you're absolutely right, Francis. Maybe not so much nowadays, but certainly a few years ago, and still to this day, people have a perception of what they see in television with swinging watches or snapping fingers. And I think that's important to demystify that because my understanding is about 18% of the population can enter a deep trance state rapidly. Now, a trance state is really no more than focused attention 
on one thing to the almost total exclusion of everything else. Um, if most people can identify a, a transit as much if they drive a car down a long road, they wonder how they arrive at their destination. Or if they've ever read a book and lost track of time, um, time goes quite quickly. So because 18% of the general population can enter deep, this deep trance state rapidly, rapidly is the keyword. The stage hypnotist, let's say he or she has 300 people in the audience, will ask all the audience to imagine their hands sticking together with super glue. And he'll lower the tone of his voice and you'll see in between the pans if your hands is the most powerful glue known to mankind. And as hard as you try uh, to separate your hands, you can't. Now, these are known as suggestibility tests. So the stage hypnotist is trying to gauge who the most susceptible people are. They're the ones he or she wants to work with. Everyone else thinks, oh, my hands didn't stick together, so I can't be hypnotized. Well, they can, but it'll just take a bit longer. The stage hypnotist wants the easy people to work with. Um, once he's found the easy people, he'll hypnotize them away from the audience and say, whenever I snap my fingers, your head will fall forward and you'll give every impression of sleep. So he's pre-programmed them with a suggestion. He'll reorientate them to the waking state. The show will start. He'll come out and he'll say, do you think you're hypnotized? He'll say, no, they go sleep. And they dutifully respond. Now, the huge point here is if they were asleep or unconscious, they wouldn't hear anything. It's half asleep, it's half awake. The state itself is not dissimilar to just before you awake in the morning and you think, well, I got up or won't I? Or just before you fall asleep at night and you maybe hear a door bang and think, what was that? Half asleep, half, half awake, quite pleasant, quite relaxing. As I'm fond of saying to my clients, you will not orbit Jupiter and come back with a personality transplant. The worst things that happen is people fall asleep, but not in the first session, because they're a bit uptight in the first session. The optimum level of relaxation usually occurs around the fourth session in hypnotherapy. And people are reluctant to open their eyes around that time. They're quite happy. They don't, they're quite relaxed. Um, I teach them that during the hypnotherapy process, they may feel their finger ends tingle, their shoulders, arms, legs may feel a bit heavy, that's limb catalepsy. They may feel their eyeballs moving about, that's rapid eye movement. Um, that's normal. Two of the best indicators for them afterwards is that they'll hopefully feel more relaxed and the problem a lot less. And also a time distortion tends to occur. In reality, the, the, the session takes about 25 or 30 minutes. Afterwards, it can feel like 10 or 15 minutes. Because the person is so inwardly focused, they lose track of external reality. So a time distortion tends to occur. That's a very good sign. And as sessions progress, the, the, the distortion uh, is more and more. For some people, it can seem like almost two or three minutes, when in fact, it's been nearer 30 minutes. Um, from, from my viewpoint, the person's, uh, you can see the rapid eye movement, their features go into repose, very slack. They sit very still as well. I'm fond of saying I'm very good at boring people into hypnotic states. <laughs> After years of practice, I'm only joking. It's quite pleasant, it's quite relaxing. Um, I also obviously try and formulate specifically just what the person wants from the session. I'm fond of saying, I know it may be a silly question, but tell me in your words what you want to achieve from today's session. And they'll usually say more calm, more relaxed, more confident around other people. That's quite a big one as well. So I try and then put everything together in a way that suits them um, with the use of metaphors, visualization, associative post-hypnotic suggestion techniques, um, and at times direct suggestion. I have had the opportunity to get to research some of your work, follow some of um, you know the talking points and, and how you actively and even seeing you work with people. There is um, one element in, um, of like the hypnotherapy is, you know, 
understanding when you spoke earlier and you said that when people give other people the power or the crystal vase of their self-esteem, yeah, who yeah. they are, their self-worth, the self-love. One yeah. thing that I believe to be true in my experiences of working with individuals and um, just over the years is that most of what we see tangibly and most of what people complain about is symptoms, the symptomatic, what is causing them that discomfort. Yeah. And then understanding that that is not necessarily like if you have an issue with your spine, you can have a radiating pain. It is your back. It's a spine issue, but it has a radiating pain in your arm. And yeah. most of the symptoms relate to how people feel or how they're making, you know, people are making them feel or how they're feeling in a situation. So they want to see an end result to better give them that feeling or that more well-deserved yeah. feeling, which again, takes us back to why working with both the cognitive as well as is so impactful and powerful. What would you, what would the approach be? So somebody were to come into your space and, you know, they're not necessarily sure what is triggering them now some people may have very specific attacks or situations where they say you know what this happened to me and now every single time you know and i can share something personal i had a, there was a i had someone kicked down a door and i was duct taped and robbed at gunpoint and so there was a period of time where and i had to do nlp and wiring on myself for hours that if i passed through a door that i couldn't see through it would kind of take me back to that initial you know that triggered space now what about for those that don't know maybe for those that do know exactly and they can say or they think this is exactly what's causing it and then what about for those people who say i don't know why they can't give you you know a specific event how do you go about helping them ask questions to themselves or kind of going into some of the recesses of that journey usually the people stress is insidious the person suffering from it is usually the last person to know about it so there's usually been a build-up over a period of time within the nervous system and then it seems like it's been one thing that, that's triggered it it's usually been a combination of a lot of events it could be physical illness um, it could be living with a difficult relationship it could be stress at work it could be a wide variety of stuff that comes together. And I mean, I think you're right in as much, most people will present to a therapist or a doctor a feeling that they dislike. Um, and again, I think it's important to, to give the person understanding more about the feelings. About 25 six, 25, six years ago, Francis, a person came into my consulting room and their hand was shaking uncontrollably. And they said to me, I've been to see a GP, but that's a medical doctor, a psychiatrist and a psychologist. They've all tried to stop this hand shaking, but it's not worked. He said, I've come for the magic of hypnotherapy. I said, well, before we get to the magic of hypnotherapy, can you tell me the lead up, the lead up to this problem? And I suspected this person had been under stress for a while because they were presenting an extreme symptom. I also suspected the person was trying too hard to be liked and not make a mistake, core belief one from rational motive behavior therapy. I didn't say this to him, I wanted to hear, hear what he had to say. He said, I've recently got promotion at work and I've been trying too hard to please my boss. I've had problems in my marriage and I'm trying hard to please my wife. One day I had to sign a check in front of the company accountant and my hand trembled. And I thought, what if he saw that? I went home that night, worried furiously and thought, what if it were to shake tomorrow? And it did. He said, the problem has got so bad, I'm drinking four cans of beer in my car before I go into work in the morning, but it's short-term gain, long-term pain. I've been to see a GP, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. They've all tried to stop my hand shaking. I then asked him if anyone had explained to him on a physiological level why his hand was actually shaking. And he said, no, they've all been talking about my childhood. And I said, I tried that early on in my career and I didn't get a lot of good results. I said, when your heart rate quickens, it secretes adrenaline into the bloodstream, which is a stress hormone. Glands above the kidneys secrete even more adrenaline into the bloodstream. This excessive amount of adrenaline affects little spindles in your fingers, 
which sends a danger signal to your spinal cord and in turn sends another danger signal to your fingers. You're getting a series of finger jerks activated by adrenaline. And his eyes went as big and he said, so you're telling me it's adrenaline that's now the problem? I said, yes, and how you're now reacting to it. He said, you mean the harder I'm trying to stop my hand shake, the more it shakes? I said, exactly. He said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. What advice would you give me? I said, I'll give you advice that you won't like, but it will work. He said, what's that? I said, I want you to initially, on your terms, let your hand shake. And he interrupted me. He said, but I've tried so hard to stop it. I say, so's a GP, so's a psychologist, so's a psychiatrist. You're trying so hard to please your wife, your boss, a company accountant, a GP, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. If your self-worth was a crystal vase and you kept handing it over to people, you'd become pretty anxious and think, what if they drop it? You have to initially be prepared to make the mistake on your terms. Within three weeks, his hand was rock solid, but he had to give himself permission to make a mistake and not worry so much about what other people thought. And I mean, what you said earlier about the fight or flight response, we, I suppose, are sort of like humans or prey animals. We're always very aware of any danger. And when it becomes amplified over a period of time, that's when the problem tends to occur. So... I think, again, simplistic as it almost may sound due to the gravity of the symptoms that people present, understanding of what's actually happening in their nervous system with the memory and their reaction goes a heck of a long way to getting them better. I hope that answers your question. Well, you know, it's such a, well, it's a, it's a real life, and you have so much there, even in the answer, and this gentleman's um, challenges, which I think if we look at the populace today, again, if we look at every symptom that we see walk through any kind of medical doors, if we sit here and we look at the, the world and we look at these expectations and we look at how we are trying so hard to show up and achieve and feel, and we yeah peel all the pieces back to the core then these are all symptoms of a self of a disconnect with self you know and, and i firmly believe that if it's you know cortisol stress anything that our physical body and this is where that beautiful merger between eastern and western medicine this is not new science this is not new proven facts i mean this stuff was shanghai dynasty all through you know india this was you know and now we're seeing emotional intelligence kind of merge its way even into um the professional realm of leadership and things like this but this understanding that as humans we are energy bodies we are energy beings for those that can actually script to energy points and say, I feel comfortable talking about that or chakras. But for those from a, from a scientific or neurological standpoint, the vagus nerve, the longest cranial nerve in our body is electric impulses and synapses touching every piece of us. You know, that's how you said you it, sending it to his fingers to his, I mean, we are always moving, looking at us from a scientific or biological ions in motion. You know, we are, we are these, we have so much energy and sensory moving through our body, you know, that is happening on top of this, the chemicals, the belief patterns, sensory from outside world if we tell somebody no well, well they don't like that because then they're off track or if they're not grounding and centering themselves and that person you know for, for if we look at a lot of what we're seeing in um, the professional round with burnout burnout is so huge people yeah. are so stressed out from work you know, like this gentleman trying to sign a check, new boss trying to please everybody. Everybody's trying to hit this unattainable imaginary bar because everybody's living in the cyclical fight cycle of you have to do what I want. I need to be what I have to be and the world better dish out to me once I do all that exactly what I've got on my goal and my that's you know that that's that's pretty intense and we're all in this kind of matrix like like the hamsters on the hamster wheel now one thing about COVID here if we look at it from a pattern interrupt or in a, a perception change or a forced i like to call it a forced um, um introspection you know we were all going we every the world was going on a world scale every hamster on its wheel and COVID came along and it literally like it was like pencils in those wheels and all these hamsters we just all went flying but in this concept the, what happens to the brain is you have what's called a pattern interrupt and in a pattern interrupt your frontal lobe is kind of like boosh change 
And change has a funny way of making us have to troubleshoot and find new ways. And it also kind of like turns the light on to things that are already existing. And one thing that we're seeing right now is a rise in, and I don't believe these symptoms, I think these were just masks. I think all these underlining elements were all just there, but when everything's kind of rolling, you know, everyone could be so busy running on their hamster wheel that they just yeah. didn't see it. And then when you have this international pandemic or something like this, all of a sudden, yeah. bam. So you see a rise in suicide, a rise in anxiety, or a rise in things that my my personal you know perspective existed. It was there. And, and there is nothing beautiful about this pandemic. I mean, I want to be completely empathetic to the challenges. I mean, you know, my mother-in-law was just in the hospital. You know, I've got a brother-in-law right. right now that is on the verge of being intubated. I mean, this is real. So I want to by no way just kind of ice over this. But for the for the sake of this 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 interview and this understanding you know what could you talk to people about as they're sitting here and now they may be like oh my gosh all these things happen so i feel this way when probably these underlining belief systems like you said have been happening for a long time and now we have episodes that are kind of activating yeah. something that is there i think what happens francis is that people tend to move bad into awful and um, i'll explain more in a moment you could argue that there's eight billion humans in planet earth so bad things therefore are likely to happen we tend to move bad into awful by saying they shouldn't happen albert ellis used to say our slogan is i will not should in myself today <laughs> i love that I, say, I tell people you didn't just should me did you just should me and then i'll catch myself shooting myself yeah that's a that's don't a big one. yeah it's a great comment and I think what he would all, Albert Ellis also said that um, we are and probably always will be fallible mistake making as human beings. But in order to ignore that fact, we create fiction and myths, heroes and heroines. We put ourselves under inordinate pressure and others to be perfect. And when they're not, we become anxious, angry and depressed. I think people become very good in inverted commas putting themselves and others under inordinate pressure for things to be a specific way rather than accepting okay i don't like the way this is at the moment but that's the way it is how can i work to change it now a friend of mine is a gp a medical doctor and his wife very intelligent highly passionate cares a lot about people his wife phoned me one day and said could you come to the house and calm him down so I went to his house and he was blazing mad, really angry. I said, what's wrong with you? He said, I've just been in hospital. I said, you've been in hospital as a patient. Were you nervous? He said, yes. The nurse. I said, did the nurse know who you are? He said, yeah. I said, OK, so the nurse is nervous. You're nervous. The ground's prepared. What happened? He said, she tried to take blood from a vein in my hand and she missed the vein. His hand was all bruised. And I looked at him and I said, but wait a minute. You're saying that shouldn't have happened. And he erupted with great fury and he said, it shouldn't have happened. And I said, you're overlooking one thing. And he defiantly looked at me and he said, what's that? I said, it's happened. He put his head in his hands. I'll miss out some of the language he used. He put his head in his hands. He says, I'm trying too hard to control the uncontrollable. He's holding me. He was recycling what had happened in the past, in the present, by saying it shouldn't have happened, and thereby creating an anxious, angry future. His whole demeanor changed. And I said to him, I said, tell me. I said, what did you want from this situation? Really good words in my view. What did you want from this situation? And he sheepishly replied, he said, since it was a blood pressure related procedure, it might have been a better idea to show the nurse how to take blood. <laughs> he was recycling what had happened and then making it even worse for the future by saying it shouldn't have happened. So if there's 8 billion fallible humans on planet Earth, bad things happen, why make it even worse? by saying it shouldn't, rather than let's say, well, what can we do to deal with this? So we're in the moment, we're on the plank of wood, 
we're proactive, we're productive, we're engaging fully. That to me says an awful lot. And, and, and seeing how he just had that own asking the questions, evoking that frontal lobe, and just and then we answer when we ask questions, we actually have an amazing ability to to come up with answers, you know, understandings internally, as well as with the thought process. All right, so you gave me an amazing segue. And we're gonna I want us to look at like change and control. You know, we the one thing most of us try to do and um, I am I am so type A personality at times in my formulated mind, and, and I will celebrate that, but I understand that sometimes that comes at a cost and I have to be aware of that, is that control, controlling things. And you know what? Change is the only thing guaranteed, yet when things change or things are out of our control, you know, it really can evoke that sense of fight or flight or that frustration in us. Yeah. You know, and then so here again, you know, I mean, we have a real life, tangible, you know, situation that everybody can relate to. We have massive change going on, massive change. And, you know, people can't control things are out of people's control. You, you know, people and you're saying, uh, you know, you know, you, you're, you're just seeing that energy and rec we're recognizing that now from a world scale. And we're kind of though we have always all been in this together, the technology age. And, you know, it's like you're 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 like right next door and you're across the country, you know, I mean, across the world, you know, and it's just like this is so we are really close to each other, seeing each other struggle. But at the same time, the polarity you know, and and technology allows it to be very vocal, you know, and, and, and share this, their feelings yeah. and the stuff. And we're feeling like it's like you almost like see the energy and you can feel it rise. So what would you with this concept of control, you know, how do we release? It's like we again, we're going to take them from that that duality balance from the thinking space into that place of release and trust to you know, so to something out of our control, which is which is challenging to uh, to humans on a, you know, on a on a day to day basis. So take us take us there. What what would you talk to people about control and change? I think I mean, if we look at Milton Erickson, what he used to say was you can always yield and come out of the top or I take control of any rebellion by telling them how to rebel. If we look at the work of Dr. Claire Weeks, she spoke a lot of about acceptance. If we look at Dr. Albert Ellis, he would move demand into preferences. So there's a common theme emerging there in my view. And I mean, most therapies I've ever read, their final conclusion will be it's all in the letting go. But it takes time for that to happen. And people have to can only do that in their own way and in their own time. And in many respects, the handshaking um, example that I gave exemplifies how people try too hard to control the uncontrollable. My friend, the doctor, was trying too hard to control the uncontrollable. I, th I think, I mean, when I used to smoke, for example, Francis, uh, and if ever I tried to give up, I, I, I would make a problem a whole lot worse by saying, I can't stand it. This is awful. This is terrible. And I knew that by taking in 4,000 noxious, toxic, cancer-inducing chemicals, that would make me feel better short term. Um, and that, that is core belief number three from REBT, can't, world conditions under which I live must be the way I want them to be. If not, I can't stand it. I had to strongly tell myself, I don't like this. I'm not happy with the cravings, but too bad my health's more important. So I think cognitively, rationally, strongly, repetitively, by telling herself the truth, which is my health is import, more important, that will gradually over time change things. And I do know that many people will say, yeah, yeah, I can intellectually, intellectually parrot what you've just said, but I can't emotionally feel that. And that's where I think hypnotherapy is quite good. When the person has conscious cognitive understanding of what's going on, my clients tell me that with hypnotherapy, that allows them to transfer that to a deeper level. In many respects, what, a good example would be a few years ago, a guy came in here and he said, after the sessions that we had, he said, before I came in here, it felt like someone had ransacked my head. It felt like someone had pulled all the furniture, the drawers out of the furniture and scattered furniture everywhere. I was lost. But giving, um, with the relaxing, pleasant hypnotherapy, 
it gave me a chance to put things back the way I now want them to be, which was a really lovely way of putting it, I thought. So I think it gives you breathing space or time to, if you like, adjust things in a way that suit you now. But my approach is certainly drawing on Claire Weeks, Albert Ellis, is to show the person what's going on um, and then they transfer it at a deeper level with, within the hypnotic state. And in many respects, uh, hypnotherapy is a challenge, not just for me, but for the person because of their pre their perception of what you said about Hollywood and what I was saying about stage hypnotism, they don't want to let go in a hurry. So I have to, if you like, gradually guide them towards that moment of letting go. And usually what's interesting, when the person lets go in here, they tend to let go of the problem as well. They trust themselves again. So it's all in the letting go so long as they know how to do it though, and are encouraged to do it and that seems to work in here anyway for the the people i see the and i think one a big thing i've also noticed you know with individuals as a response to is that when they realize that like you just said they trust themselves you know when that crystal vase i, I listen to an, the i do listen to a lot of audiobooks because my life and demands has me on the go. So most of my books I do are audiobooks. And so, um, you know, initiating through a lot of the, I actually slept to Carl Jung books there for, well, I was like, I've got no time to waste. Girls got to really get some definitive massive action. So whether or not that allowed me to rest and restore it in all those positive alpha waves, I don't, or, you know, beta, beta waves, I don't know. But, you know, I would sleep to Carl Jung books and I would sit here and listen to this and this fascination with understanding that we are gonna be okay. Like, like we can have ourselves in yeah. a ever changing and moving sensory world and and i brought up his name stephen tuig who um spent 10 years you know working creating like tony robbins business mastery he actually has like live shadow intensive trainings helping people kind of look into the shadows or or get to the points where these elements come up and um you know he basically said it's the charge it's like the sensory like as human beings with all this energy and sensory and stuff coming at us if we can sit and be uncomfortable for just a moment so it's like in this shift now as people are learning something new taking on new information coming into your space you know things may initially feel uncomfortable because yeah. we are sensory energy beings and all these things are happening when we say hey we're going to sometimes feel uncomfortable and to be cognitively present with oneself and say i feel uncomfortable right now and yeah. recognize change is happening newness is happening neuroplasticity is happening this is a positive thing and kind of like that paradigm so much is truly this paradigm shift of understanding this may feel a little bit uncomfortable but if we look at you and i believe um correct me if i'm wrong the dickinson's approach where it's like if you look at the pain if going down this trajectory what if, if we didn't change anything if you kept smoking if the gentleman kept being stressed if ever you know if we kept if we keep you know as human na human beings in this heightened state and we look and push into it and we look at our trajectory path from a state of not not awfulization but of hard truths right like sometimes you need to have you need to look at something from a very realistic standpoint and say if i continue smoking three packs a day then chances are I will probably die via cancer, via, via lung cancer, you know, proven science, what have you. So we can understand how our brain works and say, I know that I'm creating this anxiety on something, but what if I replace this with truth? Now, sometimes factual truth isn't always sweet and smells great. Sometimes you have to look at it to say, I need to promote change. And you said this in the beginning that we, you, you started with saying that people have to recognize they can change. They have a choice for change. We either you're going yeah. to change or you're not. And usually the best promoter of change is pain. Unfortunately, we Unfortunately tend to yes, stubborn. you're right. <laughs> yeah, so you're right. Yep. You no. Know? And so sometimes having like saying, okay, we're going to drop the awfulization, but we are going to discuss some hard truths that you may not want to look at like you told when you when you sat there with a the gentleman and you and you you know you asked him some very reflective questions and when we begin to ask ourselves these reflective questions if people are like well i don't want to release i want to control i want to and if they're kind of stuck on the fence like okay so don't but <laughs> ask yourself this if you choose to continue down the trajectory path that you're going to continue down without trying something or releasing or change you know if yeah. you're 
fuck change, then what does life look like for you? And so how do you get when, when you find that I know that you do it from such a released open space because there's that it's duality again, we, it's a dance. It's literally it's not this or that. Yeah. It's like this yeah. and That's right. that. It's a combination of a lot of things coming together. Unfortunately, you hit the nail on the head for some people. They have to, I suppose, bottom out before they decide to make any change. You know, I think Carl Jung said, find something more important than the problem. I think that can be helpful as well. When the person has had enough of the symptoms that they're getting or the behaviors that they're getting, they decide to do something about it. I'm fond of saying it's hard enough to help someone who wants help. It's now on impossible to help someone who doesn't want help. Um, I'm also fond of saying that the people that I see in here, I don't really need to see. It's the people that I don't see that are the ones I want to see. They're the ones that usually don't care. <laughs> The people I see are usually quite self-critical and overly conscientious. They're quite hard on themselves. It's what I call a PhD in self-criticism. They're quite hard on self. And I think they're quite good in inverted commas at putting themselves in an emotional wheelchair rather than giving themselves the all-important out. People tend to trap themselves. They're quite good in inverted commas at trapping themselves rather than giving themselves the all-important out. Um, and they can do it if they want to do it, you know, if, if, they, if they choose to do so. Um, and I think that was the work of Albert. And of course, it's brilliantly been kept, kept going. Dr. Ellis's work has been kept alive by Dr. Debbie Joff Ellis by highlighting this choice that people do have. It might be a highly rotten choice, but you've still got the choice. You can awfulize, magnify, terribleize, anxietize, depressitize or say, I don't like this. How can I work to change it? Then that's hope. And then there's light at the end of the tunnel as you move, move towards that direction. And I'd say that's probably the biggest thing that helps people, certainly in here, they'll look back and say, the one thing I realized is it wasn't the world, it wasn't someone, it wasn't cigarettes, it wasn't the situation that was making me feel anxious, angry or depressed. It's what I was telling myself about those events, those situations that was really doing the damage. So that can be quite enlightening for a lot of people. And they begin to flex a rational self-helping muscle and start to move forward with the buds of new growth, optimism, confidence and relaxation. Now, if um, I want to move in now, I want to give the opportunity if people want to connect with you and contact first, you're going to be um, featured here in the Brain Health VIP platform so they can always just reach out directly and find you there and I'll have posted all the ways to get a hold of your information and to contact you. But I'm going to let you just go ahead to just to direct to people that if they want to work with you, um, what that might look like and how they could reach out to you. That's kind of, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, being, I'm doing Skype calls all over the world. Um, and I mean, I suppose the best, my website, exclusivehypnotherapy.co.uk. That's a very good way to get hold of me. And that's very kind of you. All right, Francis, thank you very much.